Hello there and welcome to Historia Loviana Live. It's like inner time, but so, so much worse. Today we have... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, today we have back here today, Friar. Howdy. Howdy. Yee. So, uh, let me just get my laptop back over here because, you know, everything is incredibly, incredibly terrible. Uh, <laughs> and we're so unprepared. Anyway. Oh, God. What what's that noise? Uh sorry, my uh <laughs> my thing just went a bit derpy. Anyway, uh this is incredibly professional. Uh how are you in this uh, fine afternoon? Terrible. Terrible absolutely terrible. Yeah. Every everything is awful. Um I spent my afternoon uh sacrificing uh, goats to Satan to try to stop the pandemic, but it didn't seem to be working. So, um maybe try Beelzebub? I don't know. Anyway, uh, shall we just get right in on the whole uh, thing? Because this is already an absolute disaster. Uh, yeah. Right today, if you ha if you probably you probably can see if you're actually watching the live stream today, the uh, subject of today is unrecognized nations, or more accurately, unrecognized historical nations. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, because basically there's a lot of like unrecognized countries. They're like microstates or. Uh, you know, you know. I mean, microstates and uh, countries that sort of were set up to rebel but weren't recognised by anyone. I mean, current current uh, you know, unrecognised or un famous unrecognised countries include the pre Paris Treaty, America, the Confederacy, Catalonia, Donetsk, and you know, you know, pl places like you know, places like you know, places like those. You know, uh. Oh, yeah. They declare themselves to be countries, but they can't actually. But they're not actually recognised by anyone for various reasons. But there are some absolutely insane ones from the really? past, and they are truly, truly insane. Like, for example, Friar. Did you know? Me. Yes, you. Did no, no, no. You're not an unrecognised country. <laughs> I'm not sure if you declared yourself an unrecognised country for tax reasons. Uh, but no. Uh. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> so oh, sorry about that. Uh, no, that's fine. Anyway, uh so I've got a question. Uh Fry, have you heard of a place called North Dakota? <laughs> I've heard of it, yes. You've heard everyone's heard of North Dakota. It's a uh terrible it's one of the last Stalinist uh dictatorships left. It's ruled by a dictator uh who is uh considered to be a god amongst this amongst this people. Uh, he was recently in the news because he thought uh, he died. Oh, wait, no, I'm thinking of North Korea. No, North Dakota. Uh, it's cur <laughs> currently a state in the United States of America. Um, I mean, it, you could say it's a dictatorship there. Yeah, you could say it's a, a dictatorship, you know, but uh, we we don't want to be... Um, we don't want to uh, invoke the wrath of uh, Donald Trump. Or maybe we do. It'll, it'll do great for the viewerships. Um <laughs> Good people aware of the Yankee Doodle Dickhead. Don't you? <laughs> yeah, Yankee Doodle Dickhead. That's what I'm gonna call. That's what I'm gonna call. <laughs> I'm gonna call. Oh my god. That's what I'm gonna call Donald Trump from now on. Anyway, North Dakota. So North Dakota is a state in the United States, and it, it's not independent in any way, shape, or form. It's a state in the United States. Uh, but at one point, at one point, its governor did in fact declare North Dakota an independent country. And the story behind it is absolutely mad. So, it all starts with a guy called William Wild Bill Langer. And I, I already like this guy already. This yeah, guy like, he had the middle name... I mean, he's, he's got the nickname Wild Bill. So, he's obviously got to be a little bit insane. So, uh, or maybe it's one of those ironic nicknames, like he was incredibly boring. But no, actually, it's not... It's not that, it's the former. He was absolutely insane. So, Langer was a Republican, but he was affiliated with a group called the Nonpartisan League. Now, the Nonpartisan League is an organisation which I don't think would actually ever have any power in America today because basically it was rather socialist, you know. <gasps> no. Socialism. Socialism in America. So yeah, <laughs> oh my god, pretty much, yeah. So. The Nonpartisan League, basically, on behalf of small merchant farmers, advocated for the state control of grain mills, elevators, uh, banks, and other farm-related industry to wrest control from big businesses. So, 
it was socialism, but it was rural socialism, which is even more unheard of in America today. But back then, it was, you know, it was, yeah, it was sort of, I don't know, maybe uh, it was, it wasn't the norm, but it was certainly something that occurred. So anyway, uh, so basically, William Langer was affiliated with this, uh, with this organization, sort of ran on their ticket, sort of. So this was back in the days when, before the Republican Party was the wildy right wing party is today, the party of Trump. Um, but Langer got, yeah, unfortunate. But Langer got into a lot of trouble because uh, he made it that all state employees donate a part of their salary to the NPL on a newspaper called The Leader. But that in itself, weirdly enough, wasn't illegal. How it wasn't illegal in the first place, I don't understand. But it wasn't illegal. Uh, <laughs> like I'm, I'm, like imagine, just imagine if, um, just imagine if you know pe- people down in England were sort of required to donate partner salary to the Taxpayer Alliance Ugh. or some yeah Ugh. yeah that's that, that, amazing be, that, they'd be outraged you know and understandably so. That's- but, That's amazing. Yeah, but apparently this wasn't legal. What was illegal was that highway employees were paid for a federal relief program, which meant Langer was could be charged with defrauding the, the federal government because he was passing on federal funds from uh, these highway employees to <laughs> the NPL. So basically, he was actually breaking the law in that respect. Not in the respect that he you know, forced everyone to sort of paid dues to the NPL. You know, that that was fine, apparently. But, you know, once you got the federal government involved, you know, then it was, you know, a bit of a problem. And so, here's the, here's the story. Here's here's the here's what happened. So, he and five others were um, uh, brought before the Supreme Court of North Dakota. Uh, they were found guilty, but the verdict was thrown out on appeal because the... Because... Uh, um, well, because uh, of a biased hand-picked jury. So basically, he already had people out to get him. Now, this is where it got mm. insane, right? The Supreme Court of North Dakota declared that despite this, that despite this, he still had a felony conviction, so he was to be removed from office and replaced with the vice governor, right? Now, how do you think Langer reacted to this? I mean, considering his nickname is Wild Bill, I don't think he's going to take it. I think I don't think he's going to go. All right, that's fair. He got me there. I'll just uh, concede quietly. I don't think that happened. It, it definitely wasn't. That definitely didn't happen. He reacted poorly. He definitely reacted poorly. He gathered ten of his friends in the governor's mansion, barricaded Imagine the having ten friends. Yeah, gathered ten of his friends in the governor's mansion, barricaded the mansion, declared North Dakota independent, and declared martial law. And he he stayed in the mansion until the Supreme Court would meet with him in person. So that's amazing. So this was this was on so this was on July seventeenth, nineteen thirty four. So on that date, North Dakota was an unrecognized state run by a guy called Wild Bill, who because of a effectively tax fraud. Or something along those lines, effectively, uh, had just declared North Dakota an independent country. So eventually, he, rel- he relented. Okay, uh, and he stepped down. The charges were dropped in 1945. But here's where it gets mad. Okay, if this guy ran for, let's say, senator of North Dakota, how do you think people would react? God. Yeah, it would sort of be like, wait, you were the guy who declared North like, Dakota. Yeah, I use that nut gu- that nut job. Yeah, that yeah that nut job. Yeah, you you're that nut job. Why should we vote for you? Well, guess what? In 1940, he was elected to the Senate of the United States as Senator for North Dakota. No. <sighs> so after all this bullshit, and yes, I can swear here because it is my show, and I'm not on. Yeah, I'm not on BBC Radio. So, so I can say fuck as I much. I swore earlier, but how dare you swear? <laughs> yeah, how dare I swear? I'm, I'm supposed to be pure and uh, demure. But no, <sighs> he got 
elected as senator after all this bullshit in 1940 as senator for North Dakota. So... Caroline Gray says hello on the chat, by the way. Oh, so it's... Hello, someone has said hello in the chat. Hello there, Caroline Gray. <laughs> you are our first viewer. Anyway, let's continue. Hello. Let's continue with our story. <laughs> <laughs> let's continue with our story. So basically, his uh, his whole thing as senator was just as um, it was just as mad. Okay, as senator, he uh, voted against the USA's entry into the United Nations. Right, proposed a. Right, Pro- the United States doesn't actually recognize the United Nations. They do because they're on. No, the- sorry, it's the International Criminal Court they don't recognize. Yeah. That's oh right. God. Yeah. They don't recognize a lot of things. Like they don't recognize like the child. They don't recognize like the 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 bill the whole thing about rights of the child and stuff like that, which is a little yeah. bit insane. Uh, the only other countries are Mauritania and Syria, I think, and that's mainly because pretty much. Shit's already going down there, so hey ho. Anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So basically, um, okay. Here's the other thing he proposed. He proposed a bill on behalf of African American organizations, right, to fund repatriations to Africa of Black Americans. So, I'm gonna be honest with you. If if it wasn't on behalf of African American organizations, it would be horrifically racist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I just, like... It's like, bloody hell, okay. But, no, no, this, this, this is the worst part of it. He lobbied the US High Commissioner of Germany to grant a reprieve uh, for a former SS official who was on, tri- for, on trial for crimes against humanity in Estonia. Yeah. I... So, yeah, he was pretty insane in the only way American American politicians can be. And he died in 1959. So, um, his wife, by the way, ran for, his wife, I think his wife ran for either senator or governor. I haven't actually got the Wikipedia page up yet. And she lost because he thought, I got a second, you're the wife of that batshit insane guy who declared. Ooh, Fraser Morgan in the chat just said, they don't recognize anything that would incriminate themselves, which is basically everything. You're right, you're right. You know, oh, right. the United States yeah. uh, actually have something known as, nicknamed the Hague Invasion Principle. If any member of the United States military or mm-hmm. citizens is tried at the Hague for crimes against humanity, the Americans have legalized it for themselves to invade Hague and uh, re- retake them by, and I quote, any means necessary. Listen, children or something, if that was incited, that would be absolute. That, that would cause us, that was that would cause World War Three, basically, wouldn't it? What I love about it is, though, do you know the Hague would be defended by NATO? Yeah, it'll be. And the United States is a member of NATO. So, so be... the United States would We're... have to defend the Hague against the United States. No, they wouldn't, because if a, um, I think if they've got a clause that says if a country attacks uh, another NATO country, then it doesn't matter if they're in NATO or not. The aggressor gets attacked, basically. So basically, yeah. World War, basically. Not only would they drag in NATO, but they also drag in uh, they also drag in most of the EU because you know the oh, EU is yeah. going to go to the defense of the Hague. And they drag in the United Nations because let's face it, the United you know it's a UN organization. So basically, it will be World War Three. So it's yeah. It has a... Do you know what I love about it though? Is what? when this what? law was enacted? Do you know when this law when was when was it? When? It was enacted by George W. Bush oh, a cool. few weeks before the invasion of Iraq. Am I? <laughs> am I? Wonder, am I actually? Am I surprised? No, I'm not surprised. Is uh, anybody surprised? No, I am not. Nobody is surprised in any way, shape, or form. Anyway, shall we leave America for a bit and talk about yeah, a small? Let's, let's stop talking about America. No, yeah, let's yeah. stop talking about America. And shall shall we talk about a small island off the coast of Brazil called Trinidad, or Trinidad? I can't pronounce it. Anyway, it has, it's Trinidad. Trinidad, shame. Yeah, it's Trinidad with an e, not to be confused with Trinidad and Tobago, but there is an island off the coast called Trinidad with an e at the end. Uh, I think it's Trinidad. I don't, I don't know. I can't pronounce Portuguese. I can't pronounce Portuguese. Anyway, this island is quite possibly, um, quite possibly most. No, it's the sec. 
it, I think it's the second most insane story we have on this on this episode of Story Low Vienna Live, right? It is uh, the story of a French American writer who decided to try set up his own military dictatorship on an island off the coast of Brazil and oh, nearly that's a good idea. Yeah, and nearly sparked war between the UK and Brazil. So yeah, so Lovely. Right, this guy's name was James Harden Hickey, right? And he led quite possibly the most insane life possible for someone living in the nineteenth century. Right, he was born in San Francisco in 1954 during the gold rush, and he and his mother quickly moved to Paris because San Francisco was rather dangerous during the gold rush. You know, it's still quite a rough and tumble town, uh, so understandably you want to get out there. So he was raised in Paris during the reign of Napoleon the Third, and if you're unaware of Napoleon the Third, it uh, just after, like a couple of decades after Napoleon the First was overthrown. His, I think it was his nephew, uh, took over as Napoleon the Third, and basically set up a sort of imperial monarchy. So, effectively, French was a mo- France was a monarchy back then, and so James Harden Hickley was <coughs> was raised surrounded by a lot of state theatricality, pomp, and ceremony, and it gave him a love of monarchy, which. Usually when you think of monarchists, you think of guys outside of Buckingham Palace wearing all Union Jacks saying God save the Queen on repeat. But no, this guy this guy was a true hardcore monarchist, literally writing essays, at, you, know, you know, making apologies for monarchism, right? Oh, God. Yeah, he was that type of person. He was taught by Belgian Jesuits studied law at Leipzig and entered the French military academy and graduated of high marks, right? He was a master swordsman. He married a countess and then he decided to become a novelist, right? So he was a novelist. He was a swords person. He was quite possibly the most interesting man in France at the time. And I do quite like this whole... I do quite... Uh, so many jokes I could say here. Yeah, he's, he's, yeah he's such a... He he does sound like he does sound like the type of person you'd make up in a romantic novel, if you know what I mean. Um, busy, busy man. Busy, busy man. Um, but yeah, he uh, started publishing a newspaper called called Tribule, which was very pro monarchy. But this was now Republican France, and monarchism really was not in vogue, so it didn't make him too popular. And this resulted in him taking part in several duels, having several lawsuits you know, shot at him and a lot of fines for what he wrote in this paper. <laughs> uh, so the paper started in 1878 and it folded in 1887. So it lasted nine years. But uh, alongside the newspaper, he published 11 novels, two borrowed heavily from Don Quixote and Michael Stroganoff, but they oh, all, yeah, they, yeah, they all praised monarchy and were heavily anti-democratic. So not only did he, you know, not like monarchy, not, well, not only did he love monarchy, but he hated democracy. So generally, he was, um, he's what we would call today a reactionary. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, based, based, basically the type of people who, um, unironically spam Deus Fault in chat. You know. <laughs> um, and I wish I was making that, but do you want to hear some of his um, novel names? Because a lot of them were sort of, a lot of them were quite, a lot of them quite interesting titles. Like one of his novels was called A Vendian Love. <laughs> Another novel he wrote was called Letters from a Yankee. So I guess the Yankee was referring to the fact that he was born in America. Uh, but this <laughs> was the most insane thing, right? Um, oh, no, I, I think I know what this one is. The Wonderful oh. Adventures of Nebuchadnezzar Nosebreaker. <laughs> which is just... Nebuchadnezzar Nosebreaker. <laughs> what a fucking name. <laughs> That's not what I mean. Do you want to know something? It sounds, it sounds like someone sort of... It sounds like a Viking was thrown back in time to the days of... Um, to the days of, like, the early Persian Empire... And he became, you know, became known as Nebuchadnezzar Nosebreaker. Nebuchadnezzar Nosebreaker. It, what a fucking book it, name! It, I want to read that. You could, you could probably find it on archive.org, but it's going to be in French. 
So uh, I don't speak to get. That's I, the problem. I don't. Yeah. So here's. Here's the thing, Nebuchadnezzar Nose Breaker. It sounds like a sounds like a cartoon character, a rip off of um sounds like a violent rip off of SpongeBob SquarePants, you know. A cling on SpongeBob SquarePants. Anyway. Um no, <laughs> number one he did was called uh Love in the World. And this is the weirdest one. Memories of a Gummy. Okay? Now, this starts off as mad years, okay? He was made a baron of the Holy Roman Empire for his defence of the Catholic Church and monarchy, right? This is all despite the fact that the Holy Roman Empire ceased to exist in, like, 1807. But apparently were set handing out baronships for some reason. <laughs> he divorced his wife, renounced Catholicism, and became interested in Buddhism and theosophy. That's not the mad bit, right? And this is not the mad bit either. He travelled to India to study Sanskrit and Buddhism. And then he returned to fat Paris and met a woman called Annie Harper Flanger, who was the daughter of a tycoon called John Haldane Flanger, who uh, made his money in the pipe industry, working alongside uh, Andrew Carnegie. Right? Price of just said it sounds like a villain from a Dickens book. It's not it, wrong. Uh, yeah, it, 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 <laughs> it does sound like a... It does sound like it, doesn't it? Right, he got married to Annie in New York, but just before that, he went on a bit of a stag do, right? And where did he go for a stag do? Where, where do you think he went? Uh, God, oh, what would you do at this era for a stag do? Uh, I don't, I don't know. Go look at Lady Sang. Go, go look at the country. No, no. <laughs> he went. He he went to the bet, right? Okay. He went to the bet, and on the boat to the bet, and I know the bet's a landlocked country, but you know what I mean. He uh, passed an island called Trinidad, right? And he found it wasn't being claimed by anyone. And he decided to claim it to set up his own military monarchist dictatorship. <laughs> and by the way, just... Okay. Because of course. Why? Look, look, look. I've heard of lots of very mad stag do's out there, okay? And there's some there's a very, very mad stag do's out there. Okay? Uh... I when, when, once not on a stag do, but once I got so drunk and I was at a metal bar, I started counting all the people that looked like Jesus. And bear in mind, this was a metal bar, so most of the men there had long hair and beards. Yeah. So I was drunk, going around, going fifty-four, fifty-five, fifty. Oh wait, no, I've counted you. Fifty-six. 57. Yeah, that's the maddest thing I did. Never have I passed an unclaimed bit of land and went, I'm going to set up a military dictatorship there. <laughs> so, so begins the Principality of Trinidad, right? He declares himself Prince James I of Trinidad, right? He designed, yeah. and he went the whole hog, you know. He designed postage stamps, a flag, a coat of arms, a chivalric order called the Cross of Trinidad. <laughs> so he went the whole hog. Like we, we're, we're not. He really did go hard. Like he? Un, unlike uh, look, unlike Sealand, unlike Sealand, which you know, as we all know, is the small, unrecognized country on like a um on like a platform in the English Channel. You know, he actually had land. He went totally full hog here. Um. <laughs> He issued government bonds to fund infrastructure. He bought a schooner. Oh my God. And he appointed a Secretary of State and opened a consular office in New York. And when I was first looking into this story years ago, be long before Historia Loviana Live, um, I actually went on Street View and actually viewed, um, actually viewed the location of where this was. And it's now a clothing shop. <laughs> It's it's a posh clothing shop. Um, I think I think it was I think it's either Gap or it's a designer clothing shop. I can't remember exactly which one it is, but the address is publicly available on Wikipedia. And That's amazing. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Pretty much everyone in the press took the piss out of him for this, right? They really sort of made fun of him. Uh, but maybe he should have stayed low a bit with this. Because the fact that the press caught wind of this meant the island was now brought to people's attention. And there were two countries that basically uh, also realised the island exists and dip, called dibs on it. Do you want to know what those um, countries were? 
I bet one of them is the United uh, United Kingdom. I bet because like, yes. all that they yes. did was yes. just yeah. say every island was there. Pretty much, yeah. The, the UK the, the UK laid a claim on it, and Brazil laid a claim on it, right? Brazil because it was off their coast, obviously, and the UK because basically it's an island. No one else is claiming it, so it's theirs. Um, yeah, that sounds like the UK. But the UK actually occupied the island. So uh, you had a, f- a sort of a semi-freeway spat between the Brazilians, the UK, and the Principality of Trinidad. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, but mainly the UK and the Brazilians. And the Brazilians and the UK were threatening war over this island. Um, but James, Prince James, was basically forgotten. Oh, what a poor guy. But here's the thing. It didn't end there, right? We're nearly at the end of the story. We're nearly at the end of the story. Don't worry. It gets, it gets worse? Better? I don't know. It gets worse before it gets better. He wrote a letter to the US Secretary of State, right? The US Secretary of State then published a letter in the newspaper, which garnered him more ridicule, right? Um, yeah. Uh, but no, here, here's where it gets even more insane. He then drew up a plan to invade England via Ireland. Oh my god. He, he, he drew up a plan to actually invade England. I guess using mercenaries that go via Ireland and I guess sweep up Doesn't Irish... Nobody ever learned that invading England only works if you're in the medieval times. It only works. Uh, well, let's, let's put it this way. The last time England was actually invaded, as, as in they actually got troops onto the ground, wasn't even in England. It was in Wales. Uh, <laughs> you've heard of the Battle of Fishguard, haven't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, based on the Battle of Fishguard was, uh, it was Napoleonic France um, and the French gathered together a motley crew of uh, Irish rebels and French convicts and decided to try invade Wales and they went to Fishguard and they failed miserably um, but yeah so basically he drew up a plan and he went the whole hog right he went to Henry Flanger who was the founder of Standard Oil for funding um, he even sold his ranch in Mexico to raise funds that failed to make enough funds to continue basically operating the country. So basically, the country died, effectively, and the island went to Brazil. Uh, and, you know, Prince James uh, is now a king of a country. He fell into a depression, and he eventually found himself in El Paso. And he wrote an essay on he wrote an essay on suicide, which is a bad sign for a writer. Yeah, and then committed suicide in a hotel room in El Paso, right? Aww. And he went through his effects, and he found things like um, documents for for the um, for the principality, and he even found his crown. Oh. They found his crown, and it's a sad ending. It, it is a very sad ending. It is incredibly sad. Um, he just wanted his own country. And, uh, yeah, like, oh. but the thing is, he did have legal standing. The island was unclaimed, and it was only the fact that he sort of peeped up about it and said, "I'm setting up my own country on this unclaimed island." The fact that he did that brought the island to attention, and then the Brazilians and the British were just like, "Mine, fuck oh, off." This- yeah, hoarders, basically. But then again, Brazil, you know, also had a claim because, let's face it, it's off their coast. But here's yeah. the thing. The Brazilians took over the island and set up a base on the island. And in the 1950s, uh, the island came back into the news. Do you want to know how it came back into the news? Go on. How did it do um, A ship uh, docked off... Um, a, a, a Brazilian naval ship docked off the coast of... Uh, Trinidad spotted a UFO allegedly <laughs> and basically there's a lot of controversy over this whole UFO sighting because um, uh, photo experts think it's fake uh, the naval officer who um, the naval officer who actually took the photograph was you know, uh, later faked a photograph of a UFO, 
uh, and only like two other people on the ship actually spotted it. So yeah, not only did someone try set in their own country on Trinidad, uh, but a UFO was spotted. So shall we go through a sort of honourable mentions thing of other unrecognised countries? Because they're actually quite, they're actually sort of like free um, in. Uh, there's actually three unrecognised sort of countries in the UK, right? Yeah. Everyone's heard of Sealand. Everyone. And Sealand, I'm not even joking, Sealand actually sometimes does brag that it's actually a recognised country because the German government did interact with them when it got invaded by a German. And yes, Sealand... <laughs> Sealand was actually invaded by a German guy who tried to overthrow the family who actually ran the the the, the microstate. So that That's was a mad lad. I'm not even joking. Look it up. Sealand at one point was invaded, and they interacted with the German government. And from then <laughs> on, the um, the, from then on, the Sealand government, and by that I mean like. Uh, a guy and his family basically said, basically said, our country has been recognised by Germany, you know, but Germany's like, nah, no, nah, nah, we don't recognise them. We just, we just wanted our citizen back, you know, he's a little bit crazy. So that's another thing. Um, there's an unrecognised country in Orkney. Uh, and um, I'm just thinking what it's called. I actually looked it up. Let's see. Unrecognised country, uh, Shetland. I said Orkney before, didn't I? Yeah. Nice. Country Shet Shetland, come on. Unrecognised country Shetland. Yeah, it's called um It's a wee island off the coast of Shetland. Um Ah, uh, here we are. Undeclared Crown Dependency. So let's see. Uh Crown Dependency. Right, so it's called Fio it's called Forvik, right? Uh and it's on a wee island called Forwick Home. And basically, um, there basically there is a um, guy called Stuart Captain Calamity Hill, who basically went onto the island, declared it a crown dependency of the UK, but then later changed the name to the Sovereign State of Forvik, and <laughs> basically he's made up a whole sort of thing. Uh, you know, a 1490, a 1469 agreement between uh, the King of Denmark, Norway and James III of Scotland where basically he pawned the Shetland Islands to raise money for a daughter, daughter's dowry. Uh, but he claims that... Says hi all, by the yeah, way. Hello there. So, hello there. Hello there. Yeah, so basically the <sighs> Forrick home was apparently, is apparently uh, an independent country. And there's a third one, and it's... I'm trying to think what it's called. It's called... Uh, there is actually a third one, uh, and it's in... I haven't actually found the location of it, but it's actually linked uh, on the Wikipedia page of... Um, let's see, it's called... It's linked on the Wikipedia page. Uh, uh, basically, there's a sky somewhere... In the north of Scotland, I haven't actually found the location of the actual micronation, but um, he basically set up a Pictish um, micronation uh, to promote Pictish culture, which is a little bit weird because Pictish culture is pretty much extinct. Mm. We have no real records of it, but he just set up his own micronation. So yeah, believe it or not, there are micronations still going in the UK, and a lot of them are absolutely batshit insane. And uh, the reason why I'm sort of, you know, havering a little bit with this is because I have absolutely no notes about these uh, wee micronations. I probably should have planned this a little bit better, shouldn't I? <laughs> well, so, you know for next time. Yeah, I never know next time. I don't know what next subject, next week's subject is going to be, but it's going to be very interesting. Anyway, shall we move on to quite possibly my favourite unrecognised state? Go. Okay, so... There's this plate. There's this wee county in Texas, right? It's about an hour outside Houston, and it's called Van Zant, right? Yeah. Uh, it's got thirty-six thousand people, so about the same size as Livingston. Um, it's an hour. It's about an hour from Dallas, and it's got very interesting history, right? Now, Texas was a slave state, right? Yeah. It wasn't. 
it wasn't a big slave state because there's very little sort of farmland out there that would have profited from slavery, but it was a slave state. But the county itself was very anti-slavery, so much so that slave owners would avoid taking their slaves through Van Zandt County in fear that their slaves would uh, be taken off them and freed, right? So yeah. that's basically the whole thing. Now, Van Zandt actually tried to secede from Texas twice over this. Uh, the first was when Texas left the Union to join the Confederacy, and the Van Zanters were like, no way are we joining the Confederacy, we want to go back to the Union, we're going to secede. But the second time was just after the American Civil War in 1867, right? So the war ended, and the Van Zanters were mildly pissed off by the whole affair. Uh, they didn't quite agree with the Union, and they didn't quite agree with the Confederacy, and they didn't really just agree with Texas in general. So yeah. they decided to hold a convention to decide what to do. And guess what they did at this convention? Let me guess. They declared independence. Yeah, they declared independence. They drew a deck. They drew up this tiny little county, which I assume is actually was actually much smaller back in the day than it is today, because fifty six thousand people is the modern estimate. So it's tiny little, tiny little county, out out in Texas. Just declared, yep, we're just going to declare independence. Fuck y'all. And yeah. uh, Why not? They, they drew up a declaration of independence model after the American declaration because, hey ho, you know, copy paste, change the name, stuff like that. Now, this was seen as a rebellion in the United States, right? Understandably. Because yeah. they've just come out of a war where a load of states just decide to do, you say, you know what, we're leaving and we're declaring our independence, so um, screw y'all. Uh, you know, understandably heard about this, and word reached the U.S. and it reached a um, it reached a general called General Sheridan, and he just thought to himself, right, that's it. We're going to send the cavalry down there to quell this rebellion. This was a bad idea, and do you want to know why? Go. On. Because Van Zandt was a heavily wooded area. Oh. So, ah, yes. <laughs> so basically, That's a problem. yeah. So basically, bringing a cavalry into a forest is like yeah, it's like, like that. yeah, it's like bringing a um, it's like bringing a tank into the sea. You know what I mean? <laughs> it is based well, bringing a tank into the sea. Yeah, I mean they did do that at Dunkirk. They had tanks that just drove. Yeah, um, they actually floated. Okay. Yeah, that that's the thing. They they, you know, they built floating tanks, but I'm not talking about the special floaty tanks. I'm talking about the heavy, actual, you know, <laughs> sinky tanks, you know? Yeah, you know, <laughs> sinky tanks, you know, the regular sinky tanks. tanks yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, so basically, this was a bad one because it was heavily wooded county and thus made it hard for horses to uh, move to forest. So the Van Zanters, in their tiny numbers basically went to the forest, which they knew like the back of a hand because, you know, they lived there, basically ambushed this cavalry unit and saw them off. They fought, they fought the law and they won. That's you know? impressive. That, that is very impressive, but it's mainly down to bad, bad tactics. Now, here's the thing. They've clearly not read The Art of War, and I haven't read The Art of War either. But I'm sure there's a part of it which says, after a seemingly amazing victory, don't get drunk because they might be back tomorrow, right? Yeah. This, this is basically what happened to the Van Zanters. So basically, the Van Zanters were sort of like, hell yeah, we've uh, seen off these invaders. We've won our independence for the sweat of our brow. All oh, gr- glory to the new country. And they got completely wankered, okay? Which, let's be honest with you, I would do the same thing. I think everyone would do the same thing. Um, But they got drunk, and the cavalry just came back and and came back. And, of course, everyone was too drunk to actually properly put up a defence. So the cavalry just won, and just captured all the people who took part in the rebellion. (laughs) Mad lads. Yeah! So just don't, just don't, 
yeah, better advice, if you want a victory, don't get too drunk. They might be back tomorrow. They might have you. They might have you. So, uh, now here's the thing. Uh, all of them were arrested, but none of them were brought to trial, right? And do you want to know why? It's actually very simple. Go one on. of the... Uh, Apparently, one of the uh, Van Zanters was an ex-Confederate uh, soldier, weirdly enough, and he still had uh, he still had his knife on him from the war. So they were sort of uh, they were sort of locked up in ankle stocks, but they didn't pat down the prisoners. So did this ex-Confederate soldier say, "Hey, everyone, I've got a knife. I could pick the lock." So he picked <laughs> his own. So he picked his own lock. Picked everyone else's lock, and then everyone ran off, and none of them were actually brought to trial. So, yeah. So we've learned a lot of um, very interesting lessons today, haven't we? Yeah, that's legitimately quite impressive. Yeah, we've learned a lot of very interesting uh, lessons today, namely love micronations. Yeah, love my, I love micronations too, but let's be honest with you, we've learned quite a lot of lessons about how to set up your country, or more accurately, not, you know, you know, don't, you know, what not to do. And first one is, uh, you know, don't, you know, don't declare independence to avoid, uh, you know, federal uh, charges uh, from, uh, you know, for embezzling money. That's one major one. Uh, second one is... Uh, don't make too much noise if you're going to claim an island and set up your own country, uh, or else the British and or Brazilians will take the island. <laughs> or whomever is, you know, the island is off the coast of. I don't the know. The British are coming. 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 Oh, no. Oh, no. The Brazilians are coming as well. Um, and, oh, no. And also, uh, don't, you know, don't publish letters... You know, in major newspapers, or else you will be vigorously mocked and bring attention to your plan. Uh, also, uh, don't try to invade uh, England via Ireland with no soldiers. Yeah. And the third one is, if you win your sort of country building victory, which you would build your country's uh, sort of sense of national identity from, don't get too drunk afterwards. Okay. <laughs> This is this is why Scotland won the Battle of Bannockburn, but the Van Zanters uh, lost the Battle of Van Zant. You know, you, you know the Scots weirdly enough didn't get too drunk, <laughs> which which is a first. Anyway, uh, I, I guess it's um, twelve forty-five. I guess we're gonna have to uh, bring this to an end, shall we? Yeah. Well, oh, that was very fun. That was I very fun. Yes, it is. Yes. Uh, my name. Ha- my name is Abby Archer. Uh, my name is Fry. And you have been listening to History of Love Vienna Live. It's like in our time, but so much worse. We hope to see you next week. <laughs> Goodbye. See you now. Bye bye.